Obviously, you saw me this morning, but for the purpose of the video, Andrew McHale uh, from Vocera, known for our voice uh, client that works on wireless networks, predominantly in healthcare, but um, used using many other verticals. Let's try and cut some of the background noise out. I work as uh, implementation engineer in the professional services department of Vocera. So what I do is I go on site to large hospitals, 600 bed, 1,500 access points in a single building, and I assess their wireless network to see if it's going to give a good voice experience. And a huge part of the testing we do is protocol analysis. Heat maps show me if you've got coverage, maybe a couple of other little bits, but protocol analysis really tells me how the network is and how the voice is running over it. So I just want to take this session to basically go through some of the troubleshooting logic that I use when looking at my captures uh, to see whether the, the, wireless, the wireless is handling the voice well. So first of all, why, why do we care about voice on wireless? Well, let me get some audience participation here and ask you to raise your hand if you're currently supporting voice on your wireless network. Two, three, okay, can you? Okay, fine, that, that, that'll do. Not going how I thought it would, but okay, two or three. Let me put up uh, some brand names for you. Now, now raise your hand if you're supporting those on your wireless network. Yeah? Your employees phoning home at dinner time to say hi to their kids because they're not going to make it back. Your guests traveling around, you know, Skyping home. We're all doing a lot more voice and video than we think we are. So just because you don't have a purpose-built voice, voice product, you're probably doing voice of some sort. And you want people to think your wireless network is the best, right? You don't just want to say, well, I didn't plan for that, so it's, it's best effort. So... For me, capturing the data is the hardest part. Um, sounds crazy, but actually um, analyzing it is fairly simple thanks to the, the patterns I'm about to show you. But capturing it is the hardest part. Your users don't stand still. You gave them a wireless phone or wireless device for a reason so they could move around. If they didn't move around, you would just give them a, a desk phone to use. So they're going to move around on your lovely networks that contain more than one channel. But capture adapters can only sniff one channel at a time. So while I've got an adapter set to channel one, it's not sniffing channel six or 11 or 36 or 40, or et cetera. But to do good troubleshooting, we need to see all the frames involved from, with our client. And that includes all of the off-channel activities, such as when that client disappears off-channel to do some probing and some get responses and, and see where it wants to go. You need to understand what happened there and why it didn't go to the channel you thought it was. You've got to capture as close to the client as possible. I mean, that's, that's cap 101 for those that have done it. I mean, I'm talking inches and centimeters. You don't want to be capturing from the AP. You don't want to be capturing a couple of meters away because we need to see what the client is seeing. And without clients actually spitting out packet captures for us, we need to be as physically close to them as possible so we're seeing like for like if we can. And make sure you use captured apps that support the fire you're doing. Um, you know, if you've got an 11 AC client, 11 AC access point, don't use an 11 adapter because you're going to miss probably the largest part of your data, if not all of it. At Vocera Professional Services, we use OmniPeak for capturing. We found it the best tool for multi-channel capture to support multi-adapters. When it comes to analysis, we actually then take that data into Wireshark and we analyze it in Wireshark. If you're happy on OmniPeak, if you're skilled on OmniPeak, that's fine. But I'm going to be showing all my stuff in Wireshark today because that's where we've built our processes and our tools. So how do you capture data? Ta-da! This is what a Vocera professional services engineer carries when they're doing their protocol analysis. <laughs> right? I've got eight adapters into two hubs. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's... yeah, this is the backup phone. You don't mind falling off the tray when you're uh, trying to dodge out the way of a gurney. Um, yeah, we use eight adapters. I know some people are happy using less adapters, but I ha I'm trying to walk a certain amount of area. I might be trying to get three or four or even five roams, which might all be to different channels in my capture. And I don't want to have to repeat things. I don't have to walk twice, three times. So we use eight adapters. If you can do what you want with four adapters, fine. But uh, as Jerry alluded to, you're not going to be using your Mac on one channel and doing successful voice troubleshooting because you're going to be missing important data. So here's a capture from a Cisco client where somebody used the wrong adapter. 
throughout my entire deck, I've included the filters I've used in Wireshark so you guys can replicate this with your own data whenever you want. So here I'm just filtering on the transmitter address or the receiver address being my client. And this is what I saw. What am I missing? Well, you don't get acknowledgements unless there's data, and I'm not seeing my data. So clearly, this adapter is not working at the phi that the data was being transmitted at. Uh, so yeah, if you see this, this is a classic signature for when you basically used the wrong adapter, and it's pretty much go back and try again. So the boring stuff, I'm afraid. You can't do uh, good voice analysis unless you understand some things about voice. But these things actually are what make the troubleshooting easier. Voice packets are sent continuously in both directions, regardless of what the user is or is not saying. So the user's not speaking, you're probably getting this data anyway. There's gonna be frames coming across regularly anyway, in both directions. Voice clients employ a jitter or an audio buffer to try and smooth out the audio as it hits the audio chip. This is basically to allow small tolerances within your networks as the data comes into the device, but smooth out as it hits the chip. So as the user's hearing the audio, it's a nice, consistent human voice. Now these aren't huge, these are like 100 milliseconds big, so you can't miss loads of data. It's really just to smooth out the natural uh, jitter we get with any type of network. They also use packet loss concealment. So if you drop a, a packet or two, a frame or two, they, they've got mechanisms in them to, to uh, deal with that. However, if you drop five or more, then you know, that's pretty much typically the jitter buffer completely gone and you're gonna hear that. The ITU uh, is the United Nations Agency for Telecommunications, and they have a standard called G114, which looks at audio transmission over digital medium. And it basically says you've got 150 milliseconds uh, to get the audio from the mouth of the speaker to the ear of the receiver for it to be a good, normal conversation if I stood talking to that person face to face. So 150 milliseconds from my mouth, through the device, through the infrastructure, through the other device, out the speaker to the ear. It's pretty pretty demanding. Calls are set up using a session layer protocol. This is typically SIP or H23. It's by far the most predominant session layer protocols out there. However, this really just represents a handful, two or three frames at the start and the end of each conversation. It sets the endpoints up to talk to each other and tears it down again. So you're not really going to be looking at these from a troubleshooting point of view um, unless you've actually got a problem with establishing the, the, the conversation in the first place. RTP is then used as the, the protocol to get the, the transport layer going to get all the data across. RDP uses UDP, and as we all know in this room, UDP we don't get ACKs for. However, that's a layer four ACK. That is something that will actually come over as a data packet through your network if they were coming back. Do expect to see TC, uh, uh, level layer two ACKs. We are expecting 802.11 ACKs from the AP to the client and the client back to the AP. So you will see acts there, but you will not see a larger act packet that's coming back from the network because it's using UDP. And then a codec is used to encode the analog signal, which is our voice, into a digital signal for being transmitted. And these codecs come with specific metrics that specify the timing and the sizing of these frames, which is the key to troubleshooting voice. And it gives us some really nice and easy to see patterns so that we can see when something breaks and doesn't do what it's supposed to be doing. And just to learn a little bit about these uh, codecs is essential for troubleshooting. So G711, G729, and Silk or Opus are the most common codecs in use today. G711 and G729, very regimented structures. You either got a 160 byte payload or a 20 byte payload. But bear in mind that is the audio payload before any encapsulation, any headers, any encryption. So when you see that come through to your packets and your packet captures, you're going to be seeing bigger frame sizes. Typically in a PSK network, you're going to see about 210 to 270 byte payloads for G711. But the key there is the 20 millisecond timings. This, the codex specifies that a frame will be delivered every 20 milliseconds to the device. When it's not, the pattern is broken and we need to understand why, because the user's gonna notice. Yes, there's jitter buffers, so you can miss a few, but ultimately, if it's not coming in regularly 20 milliseconds, you've got a problem. And that equates to 50 frames per second. That link there takes to a bandwidth consumption um, calculator from Cisco that, that I've got this slide, this, this screen she's cutting from, and you can see uh, a bit more about the, the codecs. The Silk codec was written by Skype. 
And this is um, a new type of codec, which we call an adaptive codec. It's designed for sending voice over a medium that has varying bandwidth, such as the internet. So instead of being regimented to a certain time um, interval, it can vary that depending on the bandwidth of uh, the medium it's on. What this means is that if it makes the timing larger, then it can cram more uh, audio data into one frame, use less headers and therefore be more efficient, but ultimately increase the delay and therefore decrease the quality of the, the signal. But either way, they're still coming over in 10, 10, 20, 40 or 60 millisecond intervals, which again is nice and quick and you can very easily see a pattern and see when that pattern breaks. Skype has submitted the uh, Silk codec to um, the IETF, and it's now part of RFC 6716, which is uh, known as the Opus codec. And so Silk is now part of that for, for voice transmission. So what the hell is he going on about simple patterns? Well, here's a capture I did of FaceTime, Apple's own voice uh, and video transmission uh, function. And again, the filter's there. All I did was I said, show me my iPhone as a transmitter with a quas data type, uh, sorry, data type of quas, um, and then a priority of six, because Apple's tagging data as voice. So with that filter there, which is not rocket science, hopefully you shouldn't be scaring anyone in the room, this is what I saw on my screen. And if you look at the, or the gold column on the left, I've highlighted the delta is very, very consistent. 20, 19, 18, 20, the data is flowing in regularly. The length is all the same because it's saying, right, I've got this much data to send in this much amount of time, so it's always going to be the same. And the sequence is very easy to follow, it just increments. So without being in the room, I can tell this is a good audio conversation and people were happy with this experience. Here's Wi-Fi calling. So this is where my cellular carrier offloads my phone call onto the Wi-Fi network. So now my iPhone is using my Wi-Fi network to get the audio to the cell carrier. Again, very consistent. The delta is 19, 19, 19, and so on. Length, 214 the whole way through, sequence going up nicely. But I've put in some dashes there. If we look at the delta under the first dash, you can see that that delta has jumped to almost 40 milliseconds. Why is that? Why is the, the timing changed? Well, if you then look at the sequence column, I missed a, I missed a packet, I missed a frame. So um, the transmission happened and it was good, I just didn't capture it, but the math works. The delta is now double what it should be because there's one frame missing in there. I don't see any retries though, so I know that frame got through, just it was my equipment not capturing it. And that, believe me, you're not going to freak out if you see one or two missing packets, either from a retry or just because your equipment didn't capture it. That is not a bad experience. That happens. That is Wi-Fi. So here's Skype. Skype, I found out producing this deck, they don't actually tag their packets. Everything's going out as best effort, which really surprised me. So there's the first thing is, is I had to drop off the, the quality tag because it's going out as best effort. And, and the timing is variable. But it's still pretty consistent. It's still somewhere between 15 and 30 milliseconds coming through, and it's coming through regularly, and the length is roughly around 200 bytes. Yeah, it goes down a bit, it goes up a bit, but again, I can pattern that, I can trend that, and I can see if there's any, if there's a 100 millisecond interval, I wanna know why, I wanna look into that. Again, missed some frames there, but no big deal, I can still see that as a good experience. Here's ASCOM, you know, trying to demonstrate this is the same across all vendors. You know, this is not even my iPhone doing stuff anymore. This is um, a, a purpose-built voice device uh, that I took at customers. But again, very often 20 milliseconds, the delta only jumps when I, again, fail to capture a packet. But the same packet size, uh, G711 I would predict in use here because the length is 254 and it's coming every 20 milliseconds. Lastly, Vocera. I couldn't not do this without putting up a Vocera capture, right? So again, we use G711, so 20 milliseconds roughly, exactly the same as a Mitel length, 254, but this was actually completely different networks with different keys, but still the length is exactly the same, and the frequency is good. But what I've highlighted there in blue is retries. So we can see that one uh, sequence 1814 went out. It clearly wasn't acknowledged by the access point, or that acknowledgement didn't get through to the client because the client chose to send it again. So we don't freak out by the delta being only one millisecond away and saying, oh no, our pattern's rubbish, it's broken. We just go, well, well why is the pattern broken? Let's look into that. And very quickly we see, oh, that's because the second one is actually a retry that's done as quickly as the device can get access to the medium, which is one millisecond. So what are the common problems that we find with voice? I'm talking about wireless LAN, Zeke, this is a wireless LAN conference. Typically, you can categorize them into airtime or roaming. Very broad categories, I know, but it gives you somewhere to start when you're starting to troubleshoot. When it comes to airtime, is the air good? Are, are the frames getting through consistently when the person is stood still, not moving? 
Is there interference, basically making a lot of uh, collisions and corruptions, uh, stopping the frame getting through a good signal length? Do you have the capacity? Is the device having to wait too long to get onto the air to send its frames? What is the quality of service like? Is it tagging its packets? And very crucially, and something I see a lot is, is that quality of service tag being maintained along the whole conversation through your entire network? If it's not airtime, then typically it's a roaming issue. Is the device transitioning fast enough for this 150 millisecond delay that we've got to try and achieve? Is the client taking too long to probe and scan? If it's going on DFS channels, that can take a long time to probe one of those because we have to wait to hear a beacon. So maybe the, the client is taking too long to actually probe and scan, giving those a lot of jitter and latency. Is reassociation too long? Is your radio server got a uh, low latency link to it or is it overloaded and actually we're having problems um, getting radius authenticated as we try and roam across? Is the signal disappearing too quickly? Are you one of these people that designs for a, the minimum basic rate, in fact, no, the minimum rate of 24 megabits per second. But as that voice client turns a corner, the signal drops like a cliff and it's lost all signal before it has a chance to negotiate a roam. And then once roaming occurs, are you rerouting the data quick enough? You know, are we having to go between two different controllers in geographically different data centers? Is, you know, is, is your core network finding the new route to those devices quick enough? Something I want to call out when you're looking at troubleshooting is the addressing. Addressing can be tricky. Typically, calls are peer-to-peer -peer with um, for devices. FaceTime's peer-to-peer, Vosiris peer-to-peer, Mitel's peer-to-peer. However, sometimes it can be via a gateway. So Cisco phones go via their call manager. Skype goes out for the Skype server on the internet, and then they get it onto their endpoint. So the addressing can be different depending on whether the, the, the client you're using is peer-to-peer -peer or whether it's via some sort of SIP translation server. And remember 802.11 addressing. In 802.11, we have four addresses. We have a source address, a transmitter address, a destination address, and a receiver address. And there's a slide in the WLAN Pro's notebook about that that you can use for reference. But we need to remember that we have four addresses. So if you're coming from the LAN world, uh, where you're just looking at typical Ethernet captures, you're typically just caring about the, the destination address, whether that's the IP or the MAC, whatever layer you're looking at, you're just caring about those addresses. But actually, when we look at it, if you are looking at um, downstream data from the access point, the source address is not going to be that access point. It's going to be the endpoint that's sending the data. It's going to be the tr translation server being used or possibly the default gateway. So downstream, you need to be looking at the transmitter address because that's the access point who's sending the data to the client. Upstream, again, the destination address is not the AP. That's not the ultimate destination for this frame. The destination address, again, will be the endpoint I'm trying to get it to, or the, uh, st the, so the server that's translating it, or the default gateway. So I want to be focusing on the receiver address. I want the access point receiving this uh, frame, and so that's the, the address I want to look at. And if you're doing a capture like Vosuri does, where we have both endpoints in close proximity of the capturing devices, then suddenly the 2DS from DS bit becomes very important. Why is that? Well, here's a capture. And I've used the um, filter, the wireless LAN source address of my Vosira badge uh, with the wireless LAN destination address of my Vosira badge and a subtype of quads data. So I want to see all data to my badge. But I've got my badge sending two frames very, very quickly. And that, that goes against everything I just told you about, the patterns. Why would my device suddenly send a second one? It's not a retry and the sequence number's way out of whack. Why is that? Well, if I uncover that column and I show you that actually one of those frames is going to the AP, and the other frame is coming from the AP down to my client because I've got both clients there. So I'm seeing the frame going up to the AP and immediately coming back down to the other client that's supposed to be receiving it. So this capture actually shows upstream for one and downstream for another client. But typically when we're doing troubleshooting, we want to focus on one client at a time. We want to look at the conversation from that, AP, from that client to the AP and back again. Sometimes, yes, I do look at the whole conversation and I see both sides of it, but I start by looking at one client and seeing what that one client's problems may be. So now that I've changed the filter to be the transmitter address and the receive address, we can see that actually my, my capture looks slightly different now. And I'm seeing a different source and destination. I'm seeing different deltas. I'm still seeing one up, one down. But what I'm seeing is client one sending to the AP, then the AP sending me back audio data from client two. So I'm looking at just that leg between me and the access point. So where do you start? If I take a capture of 60 seconds in an enterprise grade hospital with lots of access points, I pick up about 70,000 frames in 60 seconds. How the hell do you start looking at 70,000 frames? You, you start at 30,000 foot with a picture. Picture's worth 1,000 words, or in this case, 1,000 frames, right? Try and make it easy for yourself and step back. 
And this is where I think the hidden weapon of uh, Wireshark is. We use IOGraph to map the data so we can see the trend. So again, I've included my filters here, but you're not gonna be able to read them from where you sat, believe me, but get the deck afterwards and zoom in and actually apply these filters to your data, change out the MAC address for your clients. Uh, and you can replicate this. So here I can see everything my client is sending to the access point. Um, that is a voice frame. Um, and I've excluded retries. So I don't wanna see retries right now. I just wanna see the first attempt to get every frame out there. The vertical axis is my quality of my connection. I said earlier, you get your client as close to your adapters as possible. So I'm seeing 100% signal quality. Yeah, percentages are arbitrary. What does that mean? It doesn't matter for this. We're just trying to see that the signal is strong and consistent. And I've got some breaks. Why, why have I got breaks in transmission? This thing that sends me every 20 milliseconds, and I'm zoomed out to a level of 100 milliseconds, so every iteration is, should be five frames. Why am I seeing dips? Well, let's layer on some more information. Let's build this picture up. Now I've added some green bars. These are probes and I happen to align with all of my dips. What do we know? When I'm probing, I can't be sending data. I have to be probing and then listening for the responses. So these dips tend to coincide with when I'm going off channel to, to probe and I'm not sending data anymore. So okay, now I don't still feel so bad about those dips. There's still more than I'd like to see, but at least those dips are happening for a reason and I know why. So let's look at the quality of the connection. Now I've layered on retries. Now I'm showing you just the retries that client is making to the access point and we see a bunch of red bars. I can see there, there's two clusters of retries, kind of middle and, and just right of middle. Why am I seeing a bunch of retries around then? Well, let's add some more data. Let's add some more color to the picture. Now I've layered on the signal strength of my access point. Now I'm showing you all the downstream packets to this particular client coming from the access point. And because I vary away from that with my capture adapters, the signal goes up and down. So I can see using the blue dots, that my signal deteriorated as I moved away from the access point. When it got to a level that was unacceptable for the device, uh, I saw probing, I saw retries increase, and then suddenly it found somewhere to go, and the signal shoots back up, and I've got good signal again, and the retries come right down. I move away again, the signal starts to drop, the retries start to increase, we probe, we find another AP, and we roam again. So in a very simple picture, with these four colors on the screen, I can tell exactly what's going on here. I can tell the client is moving, I can tell that they're roaming. I can tell that actually retries are really quite low. I can see the client's maybe doing a bit more probing than I want. Um, but in general, I can see it as a really healthy experience for the client. I'm quite happy here. I'm not gonna dig into this much more. So what does bad look like? Well, there's lots of versions of bad, but here's one of them for you. Constant retries, lots of green bars, lots of probing, signal very low. This was by design, a, well not by design, but this was a low coverage error. I'd heat mapped, it was low coverage. The guy knew, the, the network owner knew it was low coverage. He asked me to go and, go and show him it. So I found it. And wherever I find low coverage, or where at least one place I find low coverage, I like to take a capture on the customer's network to show them the effect of low coverage. People think, okay, audio gets a bit choppy. But actually retries go up. What do retries do? It brings the overall bandwidth of your network down. Um, it causes battery drain as the client because he's spending a lot more time trying to transmit. So you can tell a lot from this. So as well as heat mapping, when I found those areas aren't good enough, I've gone and proven their low coverage and what the consequences are to basically motivate the customer to improve it. So a picture gives you an awful lot of information. So the fun stuff. Yep. Yes, so that's using um, signal strength of the downstream packets from the access point filtered just to voice data. So basically... The capture Yeah, exactly. So the left hand, the vertical bar is the signal quality. And obviously as I move to and from the access point, it's not at a static distance from my adapters. It does increase and decrease. Um, and so yeah, we see that I started off well. By design, I always start in good coverage so I can show no retries. That's what it looks like. I move through the area of low coverage, and then again at the end I move to an area of good coverage. So I can show them right. For those 20 seconds I was in low coverage, and you can see that reflected in the graph and what it does. So I think I'm doing pretty good for time actually. Um, what I want to know now is actually show you me digging into some, some, some frames, because really the slides can only show you so much. So the first thing I want to do is I want to check if a network is supporting quads properly. Now, you guys probably own the network, so you can just check this in your configs, but if you're out on the floor without access to your controllers, um, or you just want to look for, for fun and see if it's actually there, maybe you suspect maybe a bug in the access points, not, not enabling cause even though you've put it on, it's good to be able to dig into it. 
And so what I've, done, I've drawn the visualization of what we're about to do in Wireshark. Again, so you can try and follow this back home in your own captures when you've got time. So I've got my iPhone with that MAC address transmitting to an SSID of voice. I'm going to apply a filter saying, show me all the transmissions from my access point. So my, sorry, my um, iPhone. My iPhone is a transmitting address. That is going to let me see what BSSID is attached to. And I'm going to find that is a BSSID that it's attached to. So then I'm going to copy that BSSID, so I have it on my clipboard. I'm then going to create a new filter, which says show me all of the subtype 8, which is looking at beacons, with that BSSID. So I'm going to narrow down to just seeing beacons just from that BSSID, and I can dig into the beacon and see where the WMM is enabled. So let's see how it goes. Okay, so I'm going to open up my FaceTime capture I took. I've deliberately stripped out all my color coding here. Um, ah, wrong screen. Well, that's going to make it difficult because now I'm not going to be able to see it. I don't want to. Okay, no, you're right. Okay. Got any technical people in the room who can. Uh, Okay, there we go. I can see it, you can see it, good, okay. I've zoomed it in so hopefully you guys can actually read what's on the screen, not looking too bad. Uh, I can't zoom in the filter bar so you guys probably won't be able to see what I'm, I'm typing but I just kind of laid it out in the deck for you. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I say apply a filter of uh, just wlan.ta equals equals and then my MAC address which is fc colon two alpha colon nine charlie colon seven nine can't type, 7 alpha, 2, 7. Okay, the bar at the top goes green to say, yep, yeah, that's a valid filter, Andrew. Congratulations, give yourself a pat on the back. I hit enter, and it comes down to being just what my device is transmitting. I could find my BSS ID from here, but let's just take this a little bit further. Let's just show the quas data, because I know that's going to and from my BSS ID. Probing could be going somewhere else. A probe response could be coming from somewhere else. So I'm going to select any frame that's got quas data in it, doesn't matter that it's corrupted. This frame showing a little red bar on the right-hand side telling me it's corrupted. That doesn't matter. Um, all I want to get out of this is the BSS ID value. So I'm going to expand out the uh, IEEE section. I'm going to find the line that says BSS ID. And I'm going to right-click on that, and I'm going to go down to Copy. And when I get to Copy, I'm going to say Value, because I want to copy the value of that BSS ID. So that's now in my clipboard. Next thing we do is I'm going to bin off that filter and go back to showing me all the data. Now I want to find a beacon, because that's what I want to fill down is really the beacons. So you can see, you'll see beacons all the time in your captures to come out so frequently. So here I've got a bunch of beacons at the bottom. So we're going to select the first beacon, and now I want to create a filter for that. So we're going to select the beacon, and we go over to the right hand side again, and you can see on the right hand side I've got a beacon frame as the type. So all I have to do is right click on that beacon frame, and then I can say apply as a filter. But I don't want to apply it yet, because I'm not done. I'm building up a two part filter here, so I'm going to go prepare as a filter instead. I'm going to say, I want to see what, is, what I've selected, so the, the type of beacon. So I click on that, and now that's in my address bar, nice and safe. Now I can move on to the second part, which is the BSS ID. So again, on the right-hand side, I'm going to find the filter BSS ID. This is the wrong BSS ID, but it's okay, I'm just building up my filter right now. I'm going to click on the BSS ID value, right-click, prepare as filter. Again, I'm not ready to apply it because it's the wrong BSS ID. I'm just going to prepare as filter and selected. So I want to see that it's a beacon and a, bit, a certain BSS ID. So now my bar is ready. What I can do is I can go up to the BSS ID that's in there, highlight it out, and then paste in the one I've got on my clipboard. So now I've got a filter saying, show me beacons from this BSS ID. I hit enter, and that's all I'm seeing is beacons from that SS ID. So I can choose any one I want. It's even selected one for me. And I can expand out the IEEE section at the bottom. And hopefully this is familiar to a lot of you. I can open up the tag parameters, and I can scroll down and see that right here, I have my WMM uh, information element, which means this SSID is supporting QAS and it's given me some parameters for how to use QAS on this BSS ID. So as simple as that, I've verified that QAS is working. Okay, next example. So once we've worked out that QAS is working, is the client tagging its frames with QAS? And more importantly, is the network honoring that end to end? So this is a capture where I had both devices in proximity of my, my adapter so I could see upstream and downstream of the same data. So I've got my iPhone again. 
I've now got my iPad. They're both talking on an audio FaceTime conversation through voice, which is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, voice function. I've got audio going upstream, and I'm going to use the wireless lands transmitter address at my back address again to see that. Then I want to see downstream audio. So now I'm going to look at wireless LAN as a receive address. So I'm going to say anything that my iPhone sends or my iPad receives. That's going to let me see the same audio frame going all the way over the access point. Notice the colors of the arrows, black up, blue down. That's going to be uh, important in a second. So then I'm going to apply a subtype of quas data again to, to narrow down what I'm seeing because there's 70,000 frames here. I don't want to see it all. And I'm going to look at uh, what that shows me in terms of the priority. So let's go back to Wireshark. Bin off this, uh, this filter. And so I'm going to start with the same filter again. WLAN.TA equals equals. Actually, I can save myself some typing. I could just grab it from the history bar for my Mac address for my iPhone. So there's everything my iPhone is sending. But I also want to see stuff that my iPad is receiving. So I'm going to say, or WLAN is a receive address equals equals my iPad, which is 3412298 Alpha Foxtrot. Eight Foxtrot six seven. Except that's not a colon. Uh, eight Foxtrot six seven. Okay, filter's gone green again. Hit enter. So now I'm filtered on data, just going up or down. So now let's grab a quas data frame. There's one. Go across the right hand side again and apply that subtype. So I want to see only quas data because I want to see the audio data going up and down. Apply as a filter because I actually want to activate this time and select it. So I've put an OR statement in already. So I've said my iPhone up or my iPad down and it's got to be cause data. So now I've got, I've got the data stream. Now with iPhones, they send lots of stuff. So I could go further here and I could actually apply a priority. I could say, well, actually all the cause data is just anything my iPhone's doing. So I could have put a, put a voice filter on, but we're not going to do that for the sake of the time. I've got enough what I want to see here. If I scroll down to where we're peer to peer, it's kind of hard to see which direction that data is going. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on any of the packets. I'm going to come over to the right-hand side again, and I'm going to find in the frame control fields the flags, and I'm going to see that it is going from the station to the access point. This is an upstream packet from the station to the access point. What I'm going to right-click on that. I'm going to say copy. This time instead of value, I'm going to say as a filter. Copy that entire filter for me. Now, you guys who don't do pack capture often might have seen that people come up here and they've got really colorful wire sharks. You know, how do they do that? Well, um, Joel created a great um, template out there you guys can use, or you can create your own depending on how you do your job and what types of data you, you like. So I'm going to go into my view menu of Wireshark, I'm going to come down to my coloring rules, I'm going to create a new rule, and I'm going to paste that filter I just copied. So value of one, so that is downstream data. So let's call that downstream. Whatever you like, you can call it, that's just what I'm going to call it. Next, I'm going to create another one. I'm going to paste the same filter. This time I'm going to change the value from one to two because now I want it to be an upstream filter. So I'm going to rename that to upstream. Okay, typing worked. Well done, Andrew. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my upstream data and I'm actually going to change the color of it. I'm going to say anything that's upstream, make the text blue. Enable both of those. Click OK. And now my capture's changed. I can instantly see what was upstream, what was downstream, just by the colors. Black goes up, blue comes down, very easy. I could also right click on the, the DS status on the right hand side and say apply as a column. And that would also show me a little Wireshark bugger in version two. But we can basically, if I make that smaller to get rid of a little bit of data, I can see from DS to DS. But current works better for me because normally I have enough columns open in Wireshark as is that I don't want to take up any more space. So I'm going to get rid of that column. But a column I do want to see, because rather than inspect every single packet for quads, I just want to basically get that bird's eye view. I'm going to find any, any frame, I'm going to come over to the right hand side, I'm going to ex ex expand the quads control. And here I can see this frame went as voice. Good job, iPhone, you sent your FaceTime packet as voice. Now let's apply this as a column and see what we see. Ooh, we've got some best efforts here. Let's do some scrolling. Can anyone notice a pattern? All of the black is voice and all of the blue is best effort. 
So my iPhone is doing a great job. FaceTime's open, it's tagging, it's there going, hey, I'm voice, you know, give me priority, get me through those queues, great. Somewhere on the network, it's going, eh, whatever, your, your best effort, I'm not categorizing you, I'm not supporting it. And so coming downstream, it's going through the wrong queues, it's using the wrong back off timers, you know, it's not getting the service it needs. And I see this a lot, I see an awful lot, so it's worth checking out. Okay, let's jump back to the slide deck. So let's, so we've got these breaks in TX. Let's have a look at why we've got a break in TX. Why did the, the device stop doing what it's doing? Well, here I'm using a Vicera capture. I've got my Vicera badge and there's the MAC address of it. And I've got my black line upstream data like I showed on the last slide, but I've got, got drops in it. Why have I got drops in it? It's going to an exercise ID uh, called voice uh, on channel 48. I'm going to apply a filter whether I'm looking at, again, the upstream data. Very, very important because these patterns, I always look at the data flow and see where it stops. I'm looking at the upstream data, the transmitter addresses my badge up to the AP, and again, looking at the quas data type to see that pattern, see when that pattern breaks. Then once I know that, once I've found the, the break in it, I'm going to strip off the quas type so I can go back to seeing everything. Why did my device stop transmitting quas data? What else was it doing? And I'm going to then poke around what my device was doing around that time. And what I'm going to find is actually there's another SSID or there's another AP doing voice. I've capitalized my visa. That's a very bad habit. It was lowercase voice um, on channel 40. And what the badge is doing is in those breaks, it's probing. It's going off and probing. So it's going off channel to probe. So let's take a look at that. Uh, let's get rid of the priority queue there. Let's open up by Vocera voice capture some data from my iPhone because it was also in the room when I took this capture. Okay, so I'm going to cheat. I'm going to use the uh, Wireshark memory. I'm going to basically say uh, Wireslan iPhone is a channel. Oh, no, I want, no, I want my Vicera now, don't I? Okay, so 0009 EF colon turn that over because you take notes when you're troubleshooting, remember, so you know what clients you're looking at. 0F B7 yeah, I typed that wrong, didn't I? There's no data. As I'm missing the F there. Okay, phew, data's back. Okay, again, I want to find a cause frame, so I can apply that filter. So any cause data frame, I'm going to right-click on it and say apply as filter and the selected. So I've got my MAC address going up and selected. Now I've got my cause data. The other thing I could do, actually, is uh, let's go ahead and bring up the I.O. graph. So open up the I.O. graph. Uh, it said on my slides, but I forgot I didn't call it out, is there's an interval at the bottom. You don't want a one second interval, that's, that's too zoomed out, that's like 600,000 foot, you're not going to see anything there. You'll go back to 100 milliseconds, and now it starts to make sense. And oh look, this is the one I showed you earlier. So we kind of already know where the gaps are, but hopefully you're following the process of how I found out what that was. So I've got my gaps. So let's look at this gap here around... 18, 20, just before 22 seconds. Let's see what happened there. So I'm going to scroll down to 22 seconds. You can actually click in the IO graph at the point you want to look at and it'll jump to it, but sometimes it gets a little bit finicky if you're not perfect. So now I'm scanning my delta column for where that transmission broke up. And right here I can see I've got a third digit. You know, when I'm looking at this, I'm using a millisecond filter, so I expect to see zero, zero, so I almost you know, the matrix style, I don't see that, I then just see the two digits after it. So the moment it's not zero, zero, I very quickly see a break in the pattern. So for some reason, there's a break in transmission of audio frames of 148 milliseconds. That's not good, according to the ITU. That's me really pushing the limits of what, what the voice wants to hear. So now let's go and strip off the, the quads data field, so I now see everything my device is doing around that time. Okay. Wireshark leaves the, the, the um, frame you clicked highlighted, it puts it at the bottom, I'd rather put it, put it in the middle, but it's right down there. If I look around there, there we can see, there is my big delta. It's dropped to 105, I'm seeing more data now, but there's a, there's a delta of 105 there now. Now what is that I see? I see a quas null function frame. What are quas null function frames used for? Going to sleep, waking up, telling the network, you're not here, don't send me data right now. So if I look on the right hand side in my flag section, I can see the power management bit here is set to I will stay up. But before that, I've got one saying I will go to sleep. So now I'm like, well, why is my device going to sleep? What, you know, it's got a job to do. It's supposed to be sending audio data. Why is it going to sleep? 
So let's look a few more cause null function frames. I've got some here, and then I've got some more here, and I've got some more here, and some more here, and somewhere I've got... Come on, don't let me down now. Well, okay, so there's a, there's a function, art function frame, and there's a probe in the middle. And that gives me a clue what it's doing between it sleeping. Now, when it goes off channel to sleep, if I don't have an adapter running on that channel, I don't know anything. I just see it's gone to sleep. Magically, it came back. But I was capturing two channels here, the two that my APs were on, 40 and 48. The transmission was on 48. And this one I can see, oh, I removed the channel column to try and get my screenshots a little cleaner. If I had the channel column up, Let's try and stick that back in. Do, 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 do. I can see this probe request was on channel 48. So this is when I was uh, transmitting on channel 40. I drove to 40, but I went off to 48 to do a probe request. So I need to tell the AP on channel 40, I'm going to sleep. Don't send me data so I can go off and do something else somewhere else. So we've got quite a large delta. So actually on this one, we've got quite a small delta. Look how long away I was away for. If I right click on this line, I can set a time reference. Now it basically says, make this the zero marker value for seconds. And now my, my, my time starts counting up. This guy went off for just 20 milliseconds to scan this channel, channel 40, uh, channel 48. If I scroll down, I found one earlier, where this guy's gone away for 105 milliseconds. Why would it do that? Well, the answer is it probably went off and scanned a DFS channel. And on DFS, clients can't just go on and send an active probe and say, hey, who's out there? Can you support me? They have to hang around for beacons. Beacon period is 104 milliseconds. So we tend to hang around for a beacon period until we hear something there. And then if it contains our SSID, we're quite happy. If it doesn't, we then have to start the probing process. So you can see how the, the, the brakes and transmission increase if you're using DFS. Okay, so we're happy. So basically, this is a normal function. It's not great, but the badge is going off channel to probe. There's no problem here. If I want to stop this happening, I need to um, provide bigger cells, or I need to provide better coverage, or I need to stop using DFS channels, or whatever it is. If I want to smooth the conversation, uh, you know, I need to get this probing down, whatever's causing it to probe. Okay. Ooh, what have we got? Okay, I'm good. Um, okay, so next example. Roaming latency. Let's look at roaming latency. So here, um, I want to see basically the first probe that's sent, because that's basically the start of my client going, I'm not happy. I, ne I need to go somewhere else. Um, but then I want to look at the first audio frame after I roam. If you just look at the first probe to the last handshake, then congratulations, you did see how long it took to roam, but you didn't include any DHCP or ARP updates that need to happen afterwards. And that it doesn't, the client doesn't start transmitting a voice until it started doing that. So we need to look at the first audio frame after we've done the roam. So here I'm using the same capture. I've got my Vicera badge again, talking to um, AP with voices ID on channel 48, black line, upstream data. I'm gonna look at it, but I'm gonna apply the same filter. I'm gonna say, right, whilst lands a transmitter address, is my iPhone. Then I'm going to see a bunch of probing. I'm going to see those probe requests. And I'm going to set a time reference like I just did for the very first probe I find out of the bulk. Then the AP is actually going to roam. And I'm going to be able to see the handshake. I'm going to see that roam happening. And uh, once that's happened, I'm going to find the first cause data frame. Uh, ideally, I'd say with voice. But again, for time, I've not used voice to really nail this down. But you'd use voice to, to double check it's a voice frame and not. Because the HCP will look as a, like a cause data frame as well. Um, I'm going to timestamp that, and we're going to compare the two and see how long the roam took. Remember, 150 milliseconds. Okay, so uh, kind of cheating already. I've already got my wire signs, my transmitter address in there. Let's put on um, quads data so we can see. So let's not put on quads data. So because you're doing a multi-channel capture, there's a really easy way to find when you're roam. I could use all sorts of complicated filters to say, well, show me when it was on this channel and then went to that channel. But the easiest way is actually to put up your channel column and scroll until it changes. So we just looked at Rome. So let's go ahead of this Rome. So I'm on 40, I'm 40 boom, I'm on 48. Now I'm on 40. Okay, so there's my, there's my Rome. Actually, I've done this a bit backwards. I want to find the first probe first. So we know a Rome happened around here. So we know that we should be seeing some probing slightly ahead of this. So if I scroll back, again, I'm looking for those uh, null function frames. It's telling me that I was probing. Okay, so there's some, there's some probing. Let's keep going back. 
Uh, actually, let Tony, let's do this. I think I was supposed to do this as part of the last demonstration. Let's uh, apply the column of the device is going to go to sleep. Okay, there we go. So now I can see when my device is saying it's staying up and when it's sleeping. So I'm looking for when it goes to sleep. So there's a sleep. There's a sleep. It's scrolling but trying to stay the same. There's a sleep. 13 seconds. Okay, that looks like the very first time my device said I'm going to sleep because I'm going to do some probing. So that's going to be my time reference. So set time reference there. That's my zero marker. That's when the device first said, right, signal's not good enough. I need to probe for somewhere better to go. And then I kind of let the cat out of the bag already. Now I'm going to scroll down until I see that channel change to 40. Now it changes there, but that's me doing my probing. That's not me roaming. That's just me going off to 40 to see if there's anybody who can support me. I'm still on, still sending my data on 40. I'm going down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you want, I can show you that um, in a second. But yeah, I would be seeing it go to 36, 40, 44, 48. I'd be seeing all of that. So why are you counting from the first probe rather than Because it, it keeps coming back and doing voice in between. It does. I'm measuring the first probe because as far as I'm concerned, that's when the signal was bad enough I need to roam. So I want to see the, how long it's taking, how long I'm taking before I, it's doing all of the searching and then finding somewhere to go and going there. Because that, that's, that time is all the time my signal's getting worse, probably. So I'm just going to reverse what you said. Well, Sarah's decision is, if I probe, I'm looking, rather than a preemptive probe. So uh, we do actually do preemptive probes, which is why you see so many green bars in, um, in that, that IO graph I showed. But not all the clients do. So the, the, what I'm trying to help people here is dig into, well, a client will almost always probe before. I mean, we do proactive probing, and when it comes time to move, um, I might have a cache of APs I want to go to, but I will still probe to make sure that AP is still there. I'll send at least one probe to say, hey, you're in my cache, I think you're good, I think you're nearby, but are you there to support me still? So you'll almost always see a voice client probe at least once for where it's planning to go before it does the roam. So how do you know this is not just a because it Because it's within about a second of me actually doing a roam. So I know that it was the start of the process. Um, yeah, if you see probing and then a change of channel, the chance are that's part of the roaming process. Whereas absolutely, if I scroll further up, I've got probes where there was no roam afterwards because that was our preemptive probing to see what was out there. Okay, so I'm scrolling down, trying to find it, change channel 40, and there I change channel 40. So there's my first key message. There's my authentication request. Now, actually, I've got a zero reference in here from the last example I need to unset. Da, 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 da. Maybe I haven't. Okay, there's the first probe. Okay, this might work out. So scroll down, find the channel change. 48 to 40. Authentication, reassociation, first screen. Now remember, my filter is showing me my voice here about the transmitter address. So you're not seeing the first key message. Doesn't, it's not, it's not, it's not there. I filtered it out. It's in the capture. I could take off the filter and you'd see it. It's there. But I'm only looking at what my device sends. And my device sends a second and a fourth. So I've got second and fourth, then I'm happy I've roamed. 254, we know, looking at the pattern, that is my voice size, so I'm happy that's the first voice frame and there was no DHCP or any other network administration I had to do to make this roam complete. So if I go across, I can see that from signal getting dissatisfactory to when I actually got onto a new access point was 1.5 seconds. It's quite a long time. A human can walk a long way if they're walking fast in, in 1.5 seconds, the signal can drop a lot. So that's how you dig into how long did a roam take. I could equally go up and say, right, well, my authentication is the start of the roam, so I could set that as my time reference, say, well, actually, the actual roam took 82 milliseconds, which is nice and healthy. PSK, you know, do the handshake, that's usually quite quick. Um, so the roam time itself was very healthy. The, the data to keep coming across the transition back and the end was good, um, but that, um, that's not the whole story. It's from when, where I started probing itself. That's, that's a different Correct. So the infrastructure did its job. Yes. Yeah. But maybe if my probing is taking 1.5 milliseconds, you're supporting too many channels for a voice client. So it kind of tells me the story. It's yes, your, your network roamed me brilliantly, but I had such a vast network to look at with so many channels that it took me too long to actually do it and I lost signal before I got there. So, you know, it's, it's always useful to look at when the client decided it wanted to roam to actually achieve it because you're degrading, you're degrading your signal the whole time. 
And so you always might be saying it's really choppy. And you're like, well, my roams are really quick. What's the problem? Well, that's because it's taking too long to find where it wants to go. And that's where you might roam the vocera aggressiveness. You might have it roaming at a higher signal to say, well, actually, don't wait to 20 SNR to roam. Roam at 22 or 24, because I've got plenty of signal here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that to you guys. 42. Right, are we back on the slide deck? We are, but you'll see my next slide. Okay, let's come out of that and go back into it. Da -da -da. So Keith kind of brought me onto my soapbox already, and a lot of the guys on Slack will have heard this from me already, but a large channel plan really hurts voice. You know, we, we're coming from a 2.4 world, which is a junk band with loads of interference and only three channels. And Vosira still works perfectly well in 2.4 if you guys know what you're doing. Now we've gone to five gigahertz and everyone suddenly needs to feel the need to use 21 channels. So we have our duty cycle down at 1%. There's plenty of space there to use a smaller channel plan if you're running voice, give a good roaming experience and, and not use all the channels. Here is an IO graph for somebody who's running 19 channels. I'm, my, my client is pretty much spending the whole time probing because in the UK we only have four, well in Europe we only have four non-DFS channels. And those are nice and quick. That takes us 20 seconds, 20 milliseconds to probe and we're happy. We have to spend at least 100 milliseconds on non-DFS channels. And the more channels you put in, the more I've got to probe. So you get this. You know, we barely finished probing all the channels in the first instance, around about the 50 second mark, before we had to start all over again because actually the signal had got that bad, we needed to move again. The AP we'd found as part of that probing and thought was good, was actually bad by the time we decided to move to it. So just to close out, voice over wireless line is only going to increase, you know, Skype, FaceTime, WhatsApp, you know, that's gonna put a load on our network. So you guys all kind of need to be able to understand it and dig into it. Protocol analysis gives you far more information than a heat map ever will about how your device is doing in the network. Voice is easy to trend. Every 20 milliseconds you see data. The moment that stops happening, you potentially have a problem that you can dig into. And the problems typically, when we're looking at client to AP, is either the air's not clean enough or your roam's not smooth enough. But don't try digging straight into data straight away. Summarize it, graph it using an IO graph or whatever tool you're using in the equivalent. See it from a great distance out to find your problems and then dig into it further. And dig deeper by building your filters up. Start by looking at the upstream. Then maybe put on a cause filter. Then maybe look at some of the downstream. Look at your, you know, filter on the priority values, things like that. But, you know, start with the data, to tra the data transmission, find where it breaks and start digging into it from there. Uh, and if you want to take your own captures this week, then come and see me. I can stand up a Vocera server in a few seconds. I can get an app on your, your smartphone and we can do some voice calls. Uh, I'm, he I'm here through till Friday morning. So come and, you know, take a capture of voice to take home and look at yourself. All right, here's the good voice. Okay, we have some time. Questions? Um, no. I, I have some questions. Sorry, I've got the mic. I'll do first, and then you'll turn it over. Um, your, uh, thank you for your analysis. Appreciate. Obviously, lots of experience in getting in, in tracking this stuff. The your recommendation of having few channel plans goes counter to when we want to push a lot of data. We want to get rid of co-channel interference. Mm -hmm. And so, is is there a solution you found that says? Maybe we put a voice SSID on only a third of the APs rather than on all of them. I mean, the, the, what you're asking for is to ruin one thing to make another thing work. Yeah. Um, and, and we have lots of clients who've asked us to do that before. So your answer on that? So if you're designing a stadium where the guy's going to be sat in his seat watching the game and voice is not a high priority for you, use all the channels available to you because you've got a lot of people in a small space. But if you're doing enterprise voice, something the business is relying on to communicate and function, as Jake said, it's a trade-off. You know, you're going to have to strip the channel plan down. Okay, you know, in an ideal world, I'd want you to eight channels maximum. That would give you pretty smooth roams. Uh, but if you have to go 12, then fine, do 12. Um, I, would, I would argue that show me a five gigahertz uh, spectrum analysis on 21 channels um, that is anywhere near... 15% utilization regularly. You know, we have plenty of space. Okay, it might slow everything down a tiny little bit, but 
it's going to make a massive difference to the voice. So yeah, it, it's a trade-off. I'm a, a voice vendor, stood up here preaching that you guys need to reduce your power plan. You have to decide what's best for your environment, but at least understand how you're hurting voice by having 21 channels to scan through. So can you alternatively uh, change the a scanning cycle in the background in your devices because some devices some clients you can do that and can you do it in your uh, clients yeah so the vocera uh, badge the current generation we brought in about 18 months ago something that we internally call proactive scanning and it basically says that when i'm not on a voice call i will go off and scan every um 10 mil 10 seconds basically for anything that's out there um or if signal drops enough, then I'll obviously do a scan as well. And then what we'll do is we will go into um, the cache. We keep five APs per BSSID. So we will say, right, which five SSIDs are good? Um, do we detect good signal from? And we'll try and probe for those when we want to roam. So we do proactively scan. But that all takes battery. You know, we need to go to sleep as often as possible. And if we're having to wake up every 10 seconds to do a scan, or even more frequency, frequently when you're moving around, then we're using that battery life and we're reaching into the battery of the device. Um, so yes, we can do it, but it doesn't always work out right. And I had a capture just the other day where um, the Vocera badge uh, had a cache, and when it went to go to the AP, that AP was no longer there. I don't know what happened. I don't know if RRM moved it. I don't know if the person had moved that quickly, that fast, that in the time since the, the cache was filled, it had gone away, um, but it changed. And the other thing is because we're using things like RRM, our networks can change on an hourly, 12 hourly, 24 hourly basis. So. Our badge bins the cache every time you, you power it down. When you take the battery out, we bin the cache and we start again. So for the first hour of the day, while that user is moving around the building and building up the channels that are near the each BSSID, again, it's having to do full channel scans for the first hour of the day, which means these things, you know, you've all heard, like, these things are really slow in the morning, right? Well, well, yeah, they're really choppy in the morning because we're still building up the map because you powered it down overnight because the network might have changed. So the question was, do, do I have experience how 11K helps? Um, 11K helps an awful lot, because um, if we've got APs in the cache um, to go to that are satisfactory, we won't do that full channel probe. And we support 8 to 11K. So if the AP's given us free information, we're gonna take that. And if the information gives us is better than what's in our cache, we'll update our cache to say, well, the AP just told me, channel 46, this BSSID is nearby. Channel 46, God, that's embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Bonded channels and all that. Um, channel 48 is uh, nearby and it's good. So yes, 11K is very useful. If you're doing voice and the client supports it, absolutely turn it on on the client and the, and the network because the more information, the better decision we can make, right? So 40 megahertz channel. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, channel bonding. So uh, yeah, please don't bond channels for voice. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, what are the drawbacks capturing frame with Wireshark? So, Wireshark, um, when I first started Vocera just over seven years ago, we, we actually used Wireshark as our capture. And the AFP caps gave us better metrics when it came to signal quality. So, um, what you saw in my IO graph is a really flat black line across the top because it's just 100%. But actually, with Wireshark, the AFP cap adapters in their driver gave me a really nice translation of that into a signal value that was a positive value. So I could actually see when you change channel, just looking at the step. So the, the, the top black line would be, would be one level. And then when I change adapter, you know, because as we all know, if you've, you've ever kind of calibrated your devices, my clients here, the difference in signal from here to here is actually pretty, pretty significant because it's been blocked. So I could see when this adapter captured it, when this adapter captured it, when this one did, because I'd see steps in my black line. It gave me an awful lot more information and I really wish we still had it. But Riverbed just haven't kept up with the AP caps. They only do um, 11N. They're 500 uh, pounds a piece in the UK for the, the 11N adapter. And there's no 11AC adapter, which is pretty ubiquitous on, on the networks right now. Um, so we can't capture in Wireshark anymore. The thing is, I believe the AP caps don't support a short, short guard interval. So you have to use OmniPeak, which does support it. Um, and yes, OmniPeak's not a free tool. It's got a more expensive license there. But the adapters are only 30, 30 euros on Amazon. You can get a Netgear adapter for 30 euros. So I can buy a suite of adapters for under 200 euros, then the license of the tool itself, and I can capture everything I need to see. Okay, can you take, last question. Can you take, just give us your top four answers you give to an infrastructure when you, when you leave saying, to make your infrastructure work better for voice, do these four things. Um, everyone loves high data rates, right? Everyone loves a high minimum basic value, uh, minimum basic rate. But 
voice actually needs kind of a, a, a soft exit. Um, so I don't like seeing uh, minimum base rates above 12 because that basically makes my, my client have to just get off of that network so quickly. There's nowhere for it to trail out if it needs to. So I don't want to see really high rates if you're supporting voice. I want to see quite low ones. Um, signal, if there's no signal, you, you know, you're not going to have a voice experience. Voice wants minus 65 dBm. So where you've got those black holes, get those black holes, those gray spots filled, basically. So you call them a black hole. That sounds like a very dark gray hole to me. Because I mean, if I have disappears. next 67 and you're saying I should fix it because it's not black, it's just really dark gray. <laughs> you're right. Most serious specifications ask for minus 65. Cisco asks for minus 67. You know, if, if I see a gray spot and um, it's tiny, and when I actually adjust the slider, it's minus 67, maybe even minus 70. If you're on five and we've got a no, low noise floor, so I've got good SNR, I'm not going to report on it. I'm not going to bust you up for it. But if I'm seeing an entire patient's room is black because you've got the APs in the corridor and they're all turned way down because they can all see each other, then I'm basically going to call you out and fail you your site and say you can't go live because there's no coverage inside the rooms. So, so coverage, data rates. Data rate. Uh, um, channel width. Channel width. <laughs> I'm a huge believer in 20 only. Okay, if you have to move a lot of data, I can see why you want to go wider. But we know that the moment you um, go to a wider channel, you add 20 megahertz, you go to a 40 megahertz channel, your SNR drops by uh, three because you increase noise by three. Well, I think you guys admit it's hard enough to get minus 65 everywhere from two APs to then actually say to yourself, well, now I'm going to throw three of those in the bin because I'm going to bond two channels. So yeah, again, I won't fail a site if it's minus four, if it's 40 width channel width, if I had a good experience. But I also, I just don't, don't really see the need for it, certainly in the healthcare environment. Um, you know, maybe, again, there's always exceptions. If you're doing... Um, you know, places like it, you're working at some sort of image consultancy or architect firm where all they're doing is moving huge files to data storage, then fine, go wider. But if you're running voice, um, you know, I, I'm actually quite excited about 11AX. If anyone heard of me on the podcast the other week, 11AX is going to give me, hopefully, a really skinny resource unit all to myself. So whatever the big boys do with their, you know, 160 megahertz wide channels, I'm going to have a tiny little one to send my data, tiny little data, very, very frequently. And that will make me very happy. All so to you, yourself. <laughs> all to myself, yeah. So don't bond. Um, and the fourth item? I had a fourth, and now you've thrown me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that just, just last week. It's in our blue building. It's embarrassing that it's still happening. Um, data rates, power levels, um, channel width. Low channels. Low use of channels. Power's another good one, yeah. If you make cells really small, great. You know, you've got lots of APs, you're really dense because you've got your capacity, you make cells really small. But what it means is voice is constantly hopping, which means it's constantly staying awake to probe and move. And roaming gives me 80 second, millisecond, 80 millisecond um, roam times. I've, the Vasuri batch has 108 millisecond jitter buffer in it, which is larger than most clients on the market. And so if you give me an 80 millisecond roam, then I've lost, you know, 66% of that buffer. So yeah, don't, don't make your smell size, size, cell, some air cell size is too small for voice. Um, you know, make them a little bit bigger with the lower data rates, uh, but keep, keep the mandatory higher, but the data rates enabled below that, which I know is, a, uh, you know, I spoke to Peter about this uh, earlier in February. Um, that's controversial, but to me, uh, have some rates below your basic to increase your cell size and give the device somewhere to go. Well, I, I, it might be controversial, but you're, you're answering the questions, what does voice need? Yeah. And I think it's just highlighting not everything needs the same requirements. And part, part of our issue is that our customers think Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. And if you're going to run voice over Ethernet or high data rates over Ethernet, you don't change the PHY. And yet you just described, oh, four things we can change the PHY to make us better will cause something else. So it, we do have a difference there.